and, uh, and hello everyone so uh, and welcome to this workshop where we will be talking about uh, lp200 a spectrograph uh, dedicated to produce uh, spectra of very fine targets. Uh, this workshop uh, will be presented by François Cochard, uh, director of Sheliac Instruments, and uh, with a guest star, a special guest star this, uh, this evening, Robin Lidbetter, who will present the very first uh, result on Supernova he did uh, with this spectrograph. And uh, this workshop uh, is recorded, and uh, the replay will be available uh, tomorrow on the Sheliac Instruments YouTube channel. So uh, now uh, it's time for the first talk uh, with uh, François presenting this uh, new spectrograph. François, it's you. Oops, I, I, I shut down my microphone. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to have so many people online. And that, that's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that this is a great subject. And uh, uh, this is really a, a pleasure to have such a, such a success uh, by the number of attendees there tonight. Uh, it's also a, a really a pleasure. I will share my screen. It's really a pleasure uh, to, to present a new instrument um uh, wow can you see my screen i'm not sure yes it's okay it's okay okay so this is the the um uh, this is uh my pleasure to to present a, a, any in any time a, a new instrument and uh, and really uh, tonight i'm very very happy because we we will talk about this uh, new uh, instrument, uh, which somewhere is uh, not totally totally new because this is a, a, a variation of the LP six hundred. But this uh, LP two hundred opens a really new door uh, to to new observations, and um, I, I like it because we will talk about the science we can make uh, with this instrument more than about the instrument itself. And, and this is uh, by far what, what is uh, the most important. So, the the so uh, as Olivier said, I, I will uh, uh, give you a few uh, introduction, and then I will let uh, Robin uh, talk uh, about his experience with this instrument, and uh, and I will come back on the, some technical details uh, afterwards, and then. Uh, well, we'll talk about techniques and also about commercials or the different uh, version of the product uh, that are available. And we'll have a quick survey at the end and uh, we'll have a, a session for questions and, and discussion. If you have some, I'm sure that you will have some. Okay, so the, the first point is, uh, what is uh, this instrument? This is a little bit strange because um, I, I like to present it as a new instrument, but in fact, uh, uh, we talk about this instrument for years and years. And uh, well, even from the, the beginning of the LP600, I even don't remember exactly when it, when it was, maybe it was in uh, uh, 2014 or 15. And the um, uh, we, we had this uh, LP600 uh, and really from very um, uh, a few few time after the introduction of the uh, LP600, uh, we had some requests, especially from Robin, asking for uh, a, a variation, in, um, a different uh, um, uh, approach. Sorry, the, the uh, different um, yeah, option uh, to, with a lower grating to have a lower resolution to shoot for very faint targets. And really, the first time that we have this request from Robin is maybe 10 years ago and he will give us the, all the details and, uh, and 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 we understand so i know for a long time that this is very useful useful to have such an instrument but so far we didn't find neither the, the time or the the, the the what we can say the, the business case so uh, I, I knew that few people would could be interested but now more and more people are really looking at very faint uh, targets and, and we'll better understand uh, why uh, with the, the Robin's talk. And, um, and, and, and now it's, it, the, the need is really increasing. And uh, regularly, uh, Robin, you, you, you came to us saying um, uh, that we, we have, uh, you have, uh, because you are talking about your observations, you have uh, people who are asking 
uh, if this is possible to uh, to to uh, have this instrument uh, for themselves and and now we are happy to say that yes now it is available we have made uh, we have made the job and 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 thank you robin uh, for pushing us and by the way also um uh, th this project recently so it is less than one year ago we had a request from the rapas project which is a collaboration uh, between uh, the amateurs and professional uh, the professionals are from the Observatoire de Paris, Paris Observatory, and uh, a French uh, amateur team. And they are, uh, they are observing very faint targets, especially they are following the, the targets from Gaia and other uh, professional surveys like that. And, and this is really a new activity where the amateurs can have a, a strong contribution. And then they did ask us to have a uh, and, and LP uh, 200. And by the way, uh, within this project, uh, they, they will also, they, they, they do also, uh, they are testing a, another solution based on a Starex with a very um, a low resolution grating, and they will compare the results with the two approaches. And and uh, well, we we will go into the, in the details later. But just be aware that um, uh, we we plan to have another meeting about this LP two hundred in French this time, and and most probably it will be with the Rapas team, and they will explain what they are doing, their first results, and so on. So it will be a very different uh, uh, presentation uh, in French. But uh, I hope that will make it in a few weeks or, or months at latest. Okay. And uh, for sure, um, there is a, a more and more demand uh, for faint targets and, and fainter and fainter targets. And um, uh, well, because really, uh, when we are talking about these targets, this is, we are talking about a sky that is totally, not totally, uh, I'm exaggerating, but uh, which is really unknown. Uh, it, it, all the objects are not in the catalogs. See, this is really something. Uh, this is a, a new, uh, a new field uh, of observation, and and uh, there is uh, we have a lot of people who are who is interested to say, well, I, I want to to discover something new and and something that nobody has already seen. So it it is very um, interesting to to go this direction. The the my experience in these uh, faint targets. So my experience, my personal experience, is very 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 low. So I'm I'm not an intense observer because I don't have the time to do it. But what what I've understood with the faint targets is that um, this is um, uh, uh, complex to observe faint targets because they are not in the catalogs. So the you have to to uh, to shoot with the coordinates. Uh, you cannot see the targets most of time in the guiding image, so you have to to figure out exactly why, why is the instrument. You have very long exposure time compared to other observations, and and you are really at the limit uh, between the the noise and the signal. So uh, even if you are exposure exposing exposing for a long time, you are to to make sure that you are not losing any photon, and and you have to do. All the efforts to have the best uh, signal to noise ratio. So all these points make that this is a challenging, um, a challenging operation. But this also makes uh, that is it is fun. A quick word about uh, what now we have the LP two hundred and the LP six hundred. So do we consider that I can take one or the other? So in our mind, and and Robin will probably say that again. Uh, very cl clearly, the LP600 is the instrument for beginners, is the, the very easy to use instrument, and you can do a lot, a lot of things, where the um, LP200 is a very special instrument, instrument for faint targets, and then for experts, for all the reasons that I, I gave you before. And, and this is, uh, it can be surprising because this is a very low uh, resolution instrument. And it, it, I think it would be, a, it would be a pity to start in spectroscopy with a such a low resolution. So if you are a beginner, if you are, for us, there is no way to, to confuse, to be confused about these two versions. If you are a beginner, if you have, if you want to do something that helps you to discover, discover all you have in the sky and observe a lot, a lot of stars, uh, at uh, with with, uh, with um, as much details of uh, as possible, go for the LP six hundred 
And only if you know that you want to have a very friend target and you accept to have a very low resolution, uh, then you can go for the LP200, okay? And now, uh, well, I, I will let, uh, I will give the, the, the mic to Robin. And um, again, this is really a pleasure to have Robin. Robin, so we, we know each other for a long, long time, <laughs> for many years. Uh, for me, uh, so he is a spectroscopist. He's a British spectroscopist for years and years, and he's very, very experienced, and, and he spent a lot of time in these uh, friend targets. He will talk about that, of course. Uh, for me, he's also the guy who is so active on all the forums and all the distribution lists. I don't know how you do that, Robin. You, it, it looks like you are spending 50 hours a day uh, to, to reply to the questions elsewhere, and you are very patient, and you are very um, helpful for all the beginners, and, and, and you, are, you love also to debate. <laughs> So you have a huge, wonderful presence on the networks, and this is very helpful for a lot of people. And by the way, you also, you also uh, the guy who did invent, I don't know if it is the right word, but you did invent the star analyzer, the, the 100 and 200, and uh, so which is a way to start in spectroscopy with a very uh, cheap uh, solution. So this is, you are an incredible guy, and this is really a pleasure to have you uh, to talk about this instrument. And, and so more, this is, of course, this is your baby. So uh, I'll let you the, the microphone. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Francois. That was a very, uh, I'm turning red with that introduction, I think. <laughs> okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, uh, this Zoom meeting is a business is new to me, so if there's any technical hitches, they're my fault. Um, but what I'll do is, if I can share my screen, I'll start uh, the presentation. You see, there's already a technical hitch. I can't get to the thing that tells me. Yeah, I don't know. This is uh, just... Okay, yeah. There, oh, there we go. One. Well, yeah, uh, Robin, sorry, just by the way, we, we didn't say that. Uh, if you have to, uh, if you have questions, please put them on the chat and we'll look at the chat during uh, Robin's presentation and we'll keep the questions for the end. And um, well, that's it. So go ahead. Yeah, I'll get to this. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so everybody can see the screen. Okay, that's lovely. Um, okay, so as, as Francois said, um, although this is a new, the LP200 is a new, uh, uh, a new spectrograph uh, for Sheliac, uh, actually I converted mine uh, 10 years ago now. So I've got quite a lot of experience of it. Uh, and my conversion is very similar to uh, the, the Sheliac version. And I've done some tests, and they are effectively identical in what they can uh, what they can do. Um, so if we look, um, as Francois was also saying, this is extreme spectroscopy. So uh, a warning about that. Uh, for example, if we say we take an LP six hundred and look at a magnitude eight star, uh, you just put the star on the slit, you uh, expose for maybe half a minute, a minute. And you'll end up with tens of thousands of photons collected for every bin in the spectrum. And you'll have a nice uh, high resolution uh, and high signal to noise uh, spectrum from the LP. Uh, if you now go to magnitude 18, which is where we're going to get down to, you're 10,000 times fainter. And suddenly your tens of thousands of photons that you collected become ones and twos. And then everything starts to matter. You have to make sure you get every photon possible. Things like sky brightness, the noise from the sky background, the camera noise, transparency of your atmosphere, your seeing, how well you focused, how well you're guiding, how you reduce that data all become critical to get down to that level. So it's very much uh, not for the beginner. If you're a beginner looking for a, uh, a low resolution general use uh, spectrograph, than the RP600. Um, I change over roughly between the 600 and the 200 around about magnitude 15 to 16. 
Uh, so if you're using your LP and you'll only be able to get down to magnitude 12, say, then the LP200 isn't really going to help you. You, you need to have a look at your technique and get your LP600 down uh, at, you know, at low signal to noise, but down to sort of 15 and 16, and then think about uh, how you would use the LP200. Uh, of course, the other thing is we're getting this higher sensitivity partly by lowering the resolution and concentrating the spectrum more, and also... Uh, the uh, 200 line grating, the, the course of the grating, the, the more efficient they are. So we're getting, uh, in the LP200, we're getting the, lower, the higher sensitivity by reducing the resolution, and that's the price we have to pay. Uh, and this example is a, an example of a bright star, RW Cephei, uh, magnitude 7.4 at the time. Uh, and this is uh, a very high signal to noise ratio spectra. So what I'm showing here in blue is what you would get with an LP600. And then in black, what you would get uh, on the same star for the same exposure with the LP200. And you can see a lot of the detail, the fine detail that we have in this uh, uh, yellow hypergiant star uh, disappears when we go down to the LP200 resolution. So if what you're looking for is that sort of high, um, this sort of fine detail in the spectrum, then you're not going to get it with the LP200. And that's the price we pay. So uh, um, really the LP200 is optimized for very faint targets near the limited detection. Uh, and that's a low signal to noise ratio. Uh, and uh, it's really for uh, objects which have strong broad features that uh, show up in these very low resolution spectra. Okay, so um, uh, the results that people get on in spectroscopy does depend to some extent on uh, their equipment they use and where, where their observatory is. So this is my observatory, Three Hills Observatory. Uh, it's in the uh, far Northwest of England uh, and it does have reasonably dark skies. I'm in a small rural village uh, and reasonable uh, seeing, three arc second seeing. Uh, but everything else is against it. We're in the wettest county in England and the cloudiest. And we're at uh, 55 north, so it doesn't get fully dark for three months. So clear, dark, transparent skies are very rare here. So I don't get much opportunity actually to use uh, things like the LP200 to its maximum. Uh, but over the years, I've got some, uh, uh, what I think are pretty good results with it. Uh, this is my observatory. Uh, it's uh, pretty conventional. It's got a, uh, a Celestron C11 on an EQ6 mount. Uh, and it sits in a plastic shed uh, and the roof of the shed hinges off so that uh, the telescope can look at the sky. Um, there's a uh, computer controlling it in the observatory itself and I control it uh, and I sit in the warmth of the house and control everything from there. Um, I've got a whole range of spectrographs. I have a Lyres, which I built one of the original ones from the kit uh, before Shelyak uh, offered it commercially. I have the star analyzer, and I'll talk about that a bit. And I also have, of course, the LP600 and my 200 version. Now, I started in spectroscopy um, 20 years ago now, just over, uh, using a, 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 a grating from a school science lab which I put in front of the cameras I was building at the time based on uh, webcams and video cameras that I built. Uh, and the grating came from a company called Peyton Hawksley Education here in the UK. Now, I was amazed by what you could do even with this. Uh, back then, there were very few uh, amateurs doing spectroscopy. Uh, and I was a bit of a curiosity in the UK, so much so that they invited me onto TV. Uh, this is the BBC Sky at Night 
uh, program, a famous program that was started by Sir Patrick Moore and has been running, oh, 50 years at least, longer, I think. Um, and they invited me to come along and show and demonstrate how I could measure the uh, redshift of a quasar using just this school science lab grating and a modified webcam that I've built myself. And there you can see it, it's uh, the brightest one, 3C273, and there's the alpha and beta line redshifted. So immediately after that, I went down and uh, visited Peyton Hall Tree Education and talked to the, uh, the guy who uh, owns it, a chap called Bob Hawksley. And I said, if you were to mount one of these gratings in a uh, one point one and a quarter inch uh, filter cell, I think we could uh, actually sell a few. And we thought we might sell about 50, maybe something like that. Well, what uh, we developed was the star analyzer. I expect uh, quite a few of you have heard of it. And maybe even some of you uh, actually got started in spectroscopy using it. Uh, and uh, I think there are now almost 8,000 of them out there all around the world. Uh, but uh, Bob Hawksley and I were amazed at the success of it. One thing that fascinated me was the ability using the star analyzer to uh, measure the spectra of supernovae. Uh, now, around that time, uh, most supernovae, well, perhaps not most, but certainly a high percentage of supernovae were still being uh, discovered by amateurs. Uh, and to get a supernova officially confirmed and named, you have to have a spectrum. And uh, amateurs were sometimes having problems getting uh, uh, professionals to take uh, time on the telescopes to take spectra of the supernova they were discovering. Uh, so there was some interest uh, from the supernova hunting people as to whether uh, it would be possible for amateurs to... Uh, do this work instead. Well, certainly with the star analyzer, you can certainly see the broad features very clearly uh, that uh, signify particular types of supernovae. Uh, and here are a couple here showing uh, a typical type two core, core collapse supernova with P Cygni H alpha uh, uh, broad line and uh, the thermal runaway type 1A with uh, the characteristic silicon two line around about 6350 angstroms. So it looked like it was certainly possible we could do it. The only problem is these two supernovae here are magnitude 12 and 13, and very, very few uh, supernovae get that bright. Um, I'll, 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 what I'll do is I'll show you that first. So this is a, a, a graph of how bright supernovae are or were in 2016 um, at discovery in green and then where they get to at maximum. And the star analyzer was working down here at magnitude 14, 14 and a half maybe. Perhaps you can get to 15, but it's very tough. But uh, very few supernovae get that bright. And when they're discovered, pretty much all of them are discovered before they get that bright. So the supernova wasn't really, uh, the um, star analyzer wasn't really a good device for confirming and classifying new supernovae. I'll just go back to that. Um, although you can see some of the characteristics in the, uh, in the spectra uh, that I showed here, uh, the most common way of classifying supernovae is to compare the spectrum with a series of a, a, a catalogue of uh, spectra taken of known supernovae at different times because supernova spectra change with time. And what these programs do is they try to match the spectrum that you've taken with this library of spectra. Uh, and from that, you can uh, uh, predict what type of supernova it is. Uh, I generally use one called SNID but there are various other classification programs that work in a, a fairly similar way. Okay, so well, the problem we had with the, uh, the star analyzer, it couldn't go faint enough. 
So uh, and that was about in 2007, I suppose, I was thinking about that. Um, and so I put that on the shelf and, uh, and went back to the uh, Lyres uh, doing high resolution work. But then in 2013, Shelyak brought out the LP600. Uh, and this was a low resolution instrument. Uh, I expect you're all familiar with it. Uh, this is mine mounted on my uh, uh, C11. Uh, and uh, so I, as soon as it came out, I bought one of the first ones. And uh, almost immediately, I set about taking it apart. And if you take the uh, LP um, core element uh, apart, uh, a spring flies out, and then uh, various lenses will drop out as well. So I don't recommend you do it. But what you find is... Uh, I don't know if I can put a mouse there. Yeah, here um, is a tiny cylinder of glass with a chamfered sloping face on it. And then that sloping face is a diffraction grating. And that's the grism. And that's the mad bit of magic that uh, produces the spectrum. Now, uh, I knew that that grism was made actually by Peyton Hawksley. Um, so I went back to to uh, Bob Hawksley and said, would it be possible to make a grism, but instead of putting the 600 lines per millimeter grating on it that you put for the Alpi, could you put a 200 lines uh, per millimeter grating uh, like you do for the star and eyes of 200? And I said, maybe I've got a good idea and maybe if it succeeds, uh, perhaps uh, Shelyak would uh, buy a few and, uh, and make an, uh, a version of the LP uh, with the 200 grating. Well, that was 10 years ago. And Bob Hawksley is uh, uh, now, uh, Bob Hawksley's son, Tom, has now taken over the business. But I suppose uh, he's actually now getting a bit of his money back for Bill, for making one for me. And this is what, uh, this is what uh, the difference is. At the top here, this is the standard uh, 600 line per millimeter grism in the standard LP. And this is the one I put in my LP. It's a 200 lines per millimeter, giving a roughly a, a, a resolving power of 130 compared with the 550 that you get with the standard. And here it is here. It, it has a chamfered face on it and sort of at a smaller angle. But in fact, the Shelyak commercial version is completely flat. It doesn't have an angle at all. And that gives a more linear wavelength cal calibration. So that's better in that respect. But that's the only difference between my LP and the Shelyak LP. OK, so uh, let's have a look what uh, uh, I managed to uh, measure with my LP. Um, first of all, what I did was I, I measured a few supernovae that had already been uh, classified. Um, and this one's from 2014. I can't actually see the top of the screen. So yes, it was discovered by the American group of supernova hunters. Uh, uh, and it was in 2014. Uh, and you can see here, this is the discovery image. And there's the supernova. And this is the guide star. Now, what you'll find when now using the Alpi 200 on faint stars, uh, you would you won't won't see the target at all in the guiding uh, in the guider images uh, unless you take long exposure guider images and stack them, and that's what I do. I typically take maybe 10, uh, 10 second guider images uh, so that I can, I can see this target. Then I can choose a guide star. I calculate the offset, the distance between the two. So I know where to put the guide star when I'm guiding that the, and then the, uh, uh, then the target will be on the slit. So it's not like uh, you uh, measuring bright targets where you can guide directly on the slit. So here we have, here is the typical spectrum. Here's the zero order. Uh, and here is the spectrum of the supernova. And all this is the sky background. Uh, this was in May, so it wouldn't have been completely dark. So it would have been in uh, astronomical twilight. So there's quite a, a bit of light from the, the sky here. 
These are uh, aired low lines uh, from oxygen. This is sodium. And then possibly you can just about see some bands. There, these are OH emission bands. Uh, uh, but we can subtract all that as usual. And here's the subtracted spectrum. Looks like my smile isn't quite right, but uh, it's certainly taken all the background out and we can clearly now see the uh, supernova spectrum. I think this was, uh, I can't see what the uh, brightness is, but I think it was about 16.3. So uh, uh, not very faint, but uh, quite faint. And uh, if we compare it with the uh, spectrum taken on a professional telescope, which is the one in blue, my spectrum is the one in red, and we can see that it's a very good agreement between what the professionals were getting and what I was getting. And we can see this dip here already tells us that it's a type two. And if we use one of the uh, spectrum matching programs, Gelato in this case, we see that Gelato has found a good match to a type two. Uh, it says type 1a but it's not it's a, oh sorry yes yes a type one yes it's a type 1a of course silicon silicon 2 and it gets a good match to a type 1a so uh, we've got a system at least now that can go to magnitude 16.3 which is further than we could get with the star analyzer and it can reliably uh, uh, classify uh, this type of supernova Okay, so then I went fainter. This one's at, I think, 17, 17.5. 17 I can't see the top. I can't see it. Never mind. Um, uh, here's the guider image. We're going rather faint now. This is 15 times 20 second uh, exposure in the guider image. Uh, and the supernova itself is rather faint. Um, this one was discovered by the assassin team. Uh, and it was... Uh, classified uh, and then as a type 1a yeah this one is a type 1a yeah uh, so I took a spectrum of that here it is um, we're going faint now so the sky background is quite intense you can see very clearly the OH bands in the infrared from the uh, air glow uh, but you can still see our supernova spectrum in here. This here is a star that was also caught in the slit and it's magnitude 11. So you can see how, how overexposed that is at magnitude 11. And the, the total exposure was six times 20 minutes. So we're talking two hours exposure here. Um, we can compare it using gelato again and gelato correctly uh, confirms that uh, our spectrum is that of a type 1a supernova. So uh, we uh, we had a system that was working and, and would be able to uh, classify uh, uh, supernovae, certainly down to magnitude 17 or so. Now about that time, there were a whole series of new uh, um, survey instruments coming online, all sky surveys. Uh, well, the one on the left is Assassin, who use very small, uh, almost um, uh, telephoto lenses, I think they are actually, or possibly, but very small aperture telescopes uh, to uh, scan the whole sky. And, uh, and then on the right, we have the opposite end, the Pan Stars, Big Ten Pan Stars telescope. And instead of the uh, maybe a couple of hundred uh, supernovae that people were finding, uh, back in uh, sort of the turn of the millennium. Uh, these were finding thousands and then tens of thousands of transients, and not just in the uh, galaxies where people were looking for supernovae, uh, but all over the sky. Uh, and the standard system for uh, confirming and classifying uh, supernova and giving them names that the uh, IAU were using uh, it was a manual system. It completely broke down. Uh, a lot of teams weren't even bothering to uh, report their possible supernovae, and they were reporting them through other channels. So it, uh, if you look at the number of supernovae 
uh, that were actually officially being named, classified and named, uh, they kept pace pretty much with the number of discoveries. But then from 2008 onwards, um, the number of supernovae actually giving, having actually given uh, official names actually dropped off and kept on dropping. And very few in 2015 actually got official names. Though, thanks to uh, David Bishop, who runs the website uh, um, for Bright Supernova Statistics, we know actually that there were something like 3,500 uh, claimed supernova discoveries in 2015. Uh, so it wasn't clear how uh, an amateur could get into this game because the, the, the official manual system just wasn't working. Fortunately, though, in 2016, the IAU introduced the Transient Name Server. Uh, and what this is, it's a fully automatic system where anybody who uh, discovers the transient can uh, upload uh, the information about it onto the, uh, onto the website. And then anybody who takes a spectrum and can classify it can also up their, upload their spectrum uh, and give it a, an official classification. And interestingly though, um, this is really for professional astronomers, but they allowed amateurs to uh, participate mainly because they were still uh, discovering transient, uh, so they could log their transient. Uh, but I, uh, I signed up for an account and I found out that uh, we were also allowed to uh, uh, confirm and classify them using uh, spectroscopy. Now, at that time, I don't think any professional would have thought that there were amateur, there was any amateur capability, and they wouldn't have been able to do this. Uh, but of course, I knew I could. And on uh, the twelfth of, uh, or in in April two thousand and sixteen, uh, I took a spectrum of a supernova discovered by a Greek supernova hunting team uh, and I produced a spectrum of it and I classified it using SNID and it told me that it was a type 2 supernova there was no doubt in it it was very obvious here's here's the spectrum it was a very bright moonlit night you can see the very intense background even though it was magnitude 17.3 16.3 so here's the spectrum I uploaded it onto the transient name server and it automatically produced a nice certificate with my name on it saying I was the official classifier of supernova 2016 BME. And um, as far as I know, that was the first time an amateur had, did, had actually officially confirmed a supernova spectros spectroscopically. So uh, as amateurs, we're moving into a new field here. It was good. It was actually a uh, because it was discovered by amateurs as well. It was an all all amateur supernova, both discovery and classification. Um, interestingly, about that time, a, a couple of months later, um, a team called the Zwicky Transient Facility, uh, who have two telescopes on Mount Palomar, a forty eight inch forty eight inch, which they. Uh, survey the sky every two days and a 60 inch the famous 60 inch Palomar telescope where they have a, a a spectrograph that they call the spectral energy distribution machine said machine and this uh, I was surprised to see that it actually used this, about the same resolution as I was using uh, with the Alfie 200 so that uh, gave some sort of confirmation that what I was doing wasn't unreasonable uh, and in fact they've been uh, they are they are a very productive team uh, and this year they found seven over 7,000 transients and they classified over 700 uh, transients uh, mostly supernovae but also some CVs and novae and other things it's a very interesting uh, instrument uh, it's a, an integral field instrument, so it can see, uh, uh, you can take spectra of a wide field, not just individual objects. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, there's a website there 
uh, where you can find out all about it. So the uh, the result of uh, all these uh, online uh, survey instruments meant that uh, the number of possible supernovae just kept on climbing. Uh, but at least you can see uh, with the uh, transient name server starting up, but you can start to see at least that we've uh, we're actually getting some more, but uh, we were actually getting some more officially confirmed uh, supernovae. But you can still see there's a huge gap, and there still is, between the number of transients detected and the number of transients that we actually get a spectrum, so we know what they are. Uh, and here are the statistics for uh, for last year. 20,000 transients in transient name server. 12,000 of them are near named galaxies and therefore could quite possibly be supernovae. Uh, but of that 20,000, only 2,000 got classifications. Uh, and we ended up with uh, uh, 18, 1,800 confirmed supernovae. So there's still a huge gap between the... Uh, uh, possible supernovae being detected and those that actually get spectra. Now, a lot of those are going to be probably too faint either for the LP200, but there's certainly a, uh, a huge uh, field for amateurs if we can get down to lower and lower brightnesses, uh, fainter and fainter brightnesses, uh, to uh, uh, do some more uh, confirmation and classifications. Now, if you are thinking of, of starting to do the same as I did and, and uh, uploading Spectra to the transient name server and classifying things, there's some important uh, points that you should follow. Um, it's an automatic system that it's aimed at uh, professional astronomers. Uh, there's no checks on what you put into it. So it's not like adding Spectra to BESS, for example, where there's somebody checking to make sure your Spectra are good. Uh, on new classif classifications are sensible. Uh, so, and if you make an incorrect classification, it ends up being a permanent error uh, and that could affect uh, future scientific research that's based on it. So uh, if you're thinking of, of doing this sort of work, I recommend you, you uh, understand first how transients are classified and practice uh, like I did, taking structure of some that have known classifications first. Uh, you also shouldn't rely on spectrum fitting programs. Uh, on very low resolution noisy spectra that we get from the LP200, they can find matches on almost anything. So you have to check to make sure the result is sensible. Uh, and importantly, if in doubt, take another spectrum or ask a more experienced observer for advice uh, or wait to see if someone else uh, produces a more clear classification. Uh, importantly, this is science, not a race. You're not racing to be the first one, one to classify it. What we're doing is we're trying to find out what uh, the object really is. Uh, also, um, if you have a lot of spectra going over weeks uh, after it was classified, uh, don't put them in TNS. Uh, there's a special separate uh, website wise rep where follow-up spectra can be uh, uploaded to and it's interesting to dive in there and have a look around there are a lot of professional uh, spectra in there for uh, showing the uh, um, evolution of uh, supernovae okay so i started that in 2016 i don't do much uh, supernova classification these years um, because uh, really my skies aren't good enough. I don't get enough cl uh, clear nights. Uh, so uh, um, most of the classifications I've done, and I've uh, done seven, I've classified 27 supernovae and then a few more um, uh, other transients like cl cataclysmic variables. Uh, but I've, only, I've, I've done about 27 and I did it in the year, mostly in the years 2016 up to 2020, so four years or so. Um, but in 2019, uh, Claudio Balcon, uh, Italian amateur, 
he now uh, collaborates with the Italian Supernova Survey Project. Uh, he built himself his own transmission uh, grating uh, slit spectrograph, and I believe it's uh, based around the uh, Star Analyzer 200. So in a lot of ways, it's rather like a home-built Alpha 200. And he has a resolving power of about 100. And he's been uh, getting some fantastic results with it. He's So far, he's classified 132 supernovae, supernovae. And he now has a larger telescope. And I think he's already this year, he's classified 11. So he's very productive with that team. I suspect he has better skies than I do, though. And uh, more recently, in 2023, just uh, a year ago, um, the uh, Chinese Exos team, uh, who have a, a survey telescope uh, looking for transients, uh, it's a pro-am team, I would say. Uh, there are a lot of amateurs involved, but they have professional astronomers helping them as well, I think. And they have a, a quite a big 0.6 metre telescope, and they have an LP600, which they use with a 50 micron slit. So that, get, well, that will give a, a, a resolving power of around 300. Now they've only just started up uh, a year ago. They've only managed to uh, classify one supernova, but they've classified several of their um, other transients, uh, particularly Novi in uh, M31. So that's, uh, that's an interesting uh, uh, interesting thing to look out for. I know they're interested in what seeing what the LP200 will do because they were one of the people who contacted me asking uh, how, how they could build one. And I said, well, you'll have to convince uh, Shelyak uh, to uh, bring it out. And, and now they have. Uh, this is a, a montage of uh, all the supernovae that uh, I've classified over the past uh, well, we're between sort of 200, 2016 and 2021, I suppose. Uh, you, uh, you can't really see them, but what I'll do is I'll pull out some interesting ones. Uh, this was an early success back in 2016. Uh, this is a supernova discovered by Ron Arbor. Now, Ron Arbor was uh, one of the uh, uh, famous... Uh, uh, supernova hunters in the UK and he has I'm not sure how many he had to his name uh, sadly he died a couple of years ago uh, but this was this was a supernova he found uh, in November 2016 it was magnitude 18 so that was the faintest uh, I'd ever been so far uh, but I managed to uh, get a spectrum which was just about good enough for classification uh, and it was classified as a, a type one, a broad line type 1C. Uh, now, uh, I took the spectrum and Ron said, well, no, don't upload it yet because I'm hoping that uh, I'll get a, a professional uh, spectrum taken. Uh, well, he, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't able to get a professional to take a spectrum and it was starting to fade. So uh, I uploaded it, uh, uploaded my classification. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm pretty confident that it's correct. And in fact, um, uh, if you try some of the other classification programs, it, it comes out with the same conclusion that it was a Type One C. So without this spectrum, this uh, supernova would never have been confirmed and been given its name. So Ron, I remember, was quite pleased with that. Um, oh, this is an example of how fast. Uh, amateurs uh, are able to relax, react to uh, discoveries. Uh, this was a, a supernova discovered by the Italian Supernova Survey team. Uh, they discovered it uh, on December the 17th, 2017, and they discovered it at 1955. Uh, they put it on the transient name server uh, 2032, just half an hour later. Uh, and I started taking a, a spectrum two hours after that, and I put my classification on, on, I reduced it and put my classification on TNS at 1.30 in the morning. So uh, it was just six hours uh, uh, between discovery and classification. And this was a full, another fully 
amateur uh, supernova discovery and classification. Oh, this was another one where uh, time was important. Uh, this was discovered by the assassin team. And I got an email uh, in the afternoon of the 5th of February, 2018, from one of the uh, members of the assassin team saying, we found this, what we think is a supernova, and it's in the same field that the Kepler Space Telescope is looking at, which means that if it is a supernova, we will have a fantastically detailed um, light curve, uh, very precise light curve, uh, right from the point of the explosion uh, and they wanted uh, a quick classification. Now, uh, I looked out of the window and it was cloudy. Uh, there wasn't much prospect of any breaks in the cloud either. But I, uh, I set up the equipment uh, and uh, pointed it in the right direction. And I was really lucky that we had about a, uh, uh, a 15 minute uh, break in the cloud. I managed to find the supernova, get it on the, uh, on the slit and take a single 10 minute exposure before uh, before the clouds rolled in again. And that just that one 10 minute exposure was good enough to do a very good classification and say it was a type a type 1A supernova. Now this, this one, uh, there were several papers written about this because of the detailed knowledge that we had about the, uh, the first uh, hours and uh, days uh, of this supernova. Uh, and in fact, it even uh, made the headlines in the Sky and Telescope. Uh, and in uh, most of the papers that were written about it, uh, I get credit for uh, being the, f the first person to take a spectrum and classify it. So that was, uh, that was nice. Uh, this was an unusual one. This was another uh, uh, type 1C. This is magnitude 16.5. Um, uh, I took a spectrum of it and classified it. And then some months later, I got an email from somebody who was writing a paper. He was a, a member of the ZTF team, the Zwicky Transient Facility. And they had been uh, gathering data on uh, particular, a particular type of uh, supernova, calcium-rich gap transient supernovae. And at the time uh, this supernova appeared, uh, the Zwicky Transient Facility was down, so they weren't able to take a spectrum of it. So uh, he asked if, uh, if they could use my spectrum in the paper, and of course I said yes. Uh, and they were very, uh, very kindly gave me uh, a, uh, uh, a co-authorship for just that one spectrum. Uh, now, supernovae don't always do what you expect. Uh, this is a supernova that was discovered by Koichi Itagaki, who discovers uh, a lot of transients. Uh, I don't know how he manages it. Um, but it was discovered on the 22nd of October 2018. Uh, I classified it when it was down at uh, magnitude 16.5, soon after discovery. Uh, and uh, I classified it as a as a oh, actually that's a type two I classified it as a type two uh, and then I forgot about it and then I was surprised to find a couple a couple of months later that it was still increasing in brightness now type two normal uh, supernovae normally reach uh, maximum brightness in a week or two from discovery uh, and then they fade so this was something odd. So I took another spectrum just past maximum uh, when it was brighter at magnitude 15, and then another one when it had got back to maximum uh, magnitude 16.5 a few months later. Now it turns out that this uh, uh, this isn't the normal type of uh, type two supernova, uh, which explodes, which is a uh, a uh, a red giant star like Betelgeuse, for example. Uh, this was produced by a uh, uh, a blue supergiant, and it was similar to the famous uh, supernova 
1987A, which exploded in the uh, uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, the brightest supernova in modern times. And uh, of course, there were papers written about this, of course, as well. Though I didn't get a mention this time, but I was the person who classified it for. Now, of course, if you have a bright supernova with the LP200, you can keep following it for a long time. And this was uh, SN2017 EAW. Uh, it got up to uh, magnitude 13 at maximum. And here's its spectrum as a type 2p. I didn't classify this one, somebody else did, but I took a spectrum when it was bright. Uh, then I took another spectrum with the LP200 when it was down to magnitude 16. And another one when it was right down at magnitude 18. So you can see with a sensitive instrument like the RP200, you can follow supernovae in this case for a year. And here is its spectrum uh, a year later. And you can see it's totally different from uh, the, the spectrum when it exploded. And here's the spectrum in more detail, that year old spectrum. You can see uh, I've uh, annotated some of the lines. And you can see that you can still get a, a good fit to a type two supernova, even after a year's time. Okay, so that's some of the uh, supernovae that I've uh, looked at with uh, uh, my version of the LP200. Uh, but of course, supernovae aren't the only thing that are faint in the sky. Uh, and another uh, object, which is a nice target for uh, very low resolution of the LP200 are um, quasars. And here's a set of quasars that I've taken uh, all over with redshifts all over 7.3. So ranging from 7.43 to 7.45. So we're looking back to a time when the universe was only 10% of its current age. Uh, and of course, the redshift means that uh, what we're looking at in the visible was way down in the ultraviolet originally. And what we're seeing here, this peak here, is the Lyman Alpha line. Uh, but instead of being at uh, down at, uh, I'm not sure what it is, 1200 angstroms, uh, it's up at uh, around where we would expect the hydrogen Balma, hydrogen alpha Balma line to be. Uh, the wavelength's been stretched by a factor of five and a half. Now, these are, as well as being very distant, they're rather faint as well. And I've given the G and R magnitudes for these. It's obviously quite a bit brighter in R, which is this range, compared with G, which is here. Uh, but the, the in red are the spectra that I took, uh, and I've overlaid them uh, on uh, in grey, these are the spectra taken by uh, large professional telescopes. Uh, and you can see a good agreement between the spectra I'm taking uh, and the uh, professional spectra. So I think that's uh, pretty remarkable, particularly this one, which I think is the faintest and most distant object certainly I've ever taken. Uh, I, I doubt actually that any amateurs have taken spectra any deeper than this one. Uh, it's G magnitude 20 and our magnitude 18.4, here it is here. Okay, so that's my version. Uh, I've been uh, doing some work with uh, Sheliak's version. Uh, they kindly let, let me have one to, uh, to test. Uh, I tested it on the bench, and as far as I can see, it behaves exactly the same as my version, which is not surprising. Uh, uh, and then I have also test, tried to test it on the sky. Now, conditions haven't been very good. Uh, but uh, 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 here are a couple of uh, rather faint objects that I've managed to uh, measure. Uh, here is... Uh, now, on, now, here, I can't actually see the name of the supernova. It's 2000, 2023 VXT, is it? I think, this one. Um, this was an interesting one. Uh, it, uh, if you look at the digitized sky survey image, you can't see any sign of a galaxy. So it's, it's almost as though it's on its own. There must be a faint galaxy there, but uh, 
Uh, there's no sign of it in the DSS image. Uh, here it is in my LP guider, 10 times 20 seconds exposure. Now, one thing to point out is I use a cooled camera, uh, a cooled long exposure camera for my guider uh, because I need to be able to see these objects, these faint objects, uh, so I can measure the diff offset between the supernova and the, the star I'm going to use as a guide star. So I measure the X and Y offset of the, uh, of the target relative to the guide star. I know where the slit is in PhD, which I use for guiding. Therefore, I know where I have to place the guide star to put that faint object on the slit. And after taking this long exposure image, I never actually see it again because the uh, guider image one or two seconds, you just don't see that. You wouldn't even see it if, if it wasn't on the slit. So uh, uh, it, it's quite interesting to do that. You calculate the offset, you start guiding on this, and then you wait for 20 minutes to find out whether you've done it right. And if you've done it right, the, the spectrum appears. If you've got your calculations wrong, you see absolutely nothing. So it, it's a tricky part of uh, measuring these faint objects. So there, there's the guider image, and this is the spectrum. So at the top, we have the raw spectrum. This is the uh, LP200 Shellyak version now. So we have, uh, this sits in the middle of the frame, and we have the uh, blazed order spectrum here. You can see very clearly here the uh, OH bands, that's aired low, and the aired low from the lines here. But also here, this, region here and this broad region here, this is LED lighting. Now, LED lighting, of course, is taking over the world. Uh, in theory, it should reduce light pollution, but uh, that's not been my experience. My light pollution's got worse as they've changed over to LED lighting. Anyway, we can have a go at, at uh, extract, uh, subtracting the sky background. And here it is with the sky background subtracted. Uh, and here is our magnitude 17.5 spectrum of a supernova. Now, because I'm experienced, I immediately know it's a 1A because there's this dip here and this dip is the silicon two line. Uh, but we can put it through uh, uh, SNID and SNID confirms that it is indeed uh, uh, a type 1A supernova. Now, I didn't actually classify this uh, because uh, Claudio Balcon got there just before me and he put up his classification using his very similar instrument, actually, uh, in a lot of ways to the LP200 uh, with his larger telescope, too. OK, so this is another one. Uh, uh, oh, I can't even... I can't, on my screen, I can't see the top line of my display. So I think this is 2024. Uh, is it? Oh, I can see it on there. 2024 VS, yes. So this was discovered at magnitude 17, or was measured at magnitude 17 in an hour, three times 20 minutes exposure. Here's the guider image. You can see it. It's actually just to one side of the... Uh, of the suit of the uh, galaxy and there's the guide star uh, there's the spectrum i got uh, and it was good enough to classify it as a type two now actually this is the second spectrum i took this is the second one i took on the 15th uh, of january I, I took one the night before and i can show it there this is the one i took the night before so I did a 90 minute exposure and you can see there's not much detail in there's perhaps something happening here around about hydrogen beta and it has a blue continuum. So I had a pretty good idea what it was, that it was going to be a type two. Um, but it wasn't good enough to classify it. Uh, so, I took a so I took a second spectrum, that's the one I've just showed you, and you can see We've got this feature here, but also the feature emerging here, which is at hydrogen alpha. Uh, so that was good enough to classify it 
uh, as a type two supernova. Now, I didn't know, but actually both Claudio Balcon and the Chinese EXOS team were also taking spectra of this object. So mine, this is the earliest one. This is the first one I took, which was too, not good enough, too early to take a, a, a uh, classification because these, these features in type two supernova develop slowly. Uh, so this one was good enough for a classification. Uh, then the EXOS team had taken, taken another spectrum just uh, a few hours later. Uh, and there's their spectrum. And it's a bit later. And you can start seeing the features develop more. And they were able to classify it as a, a type 2 as well. And then finally, uh, last, was Claudio Balcom's. And the features have developed even more. Uh, now, although he took, he was the last person to take the spectrum, he he uh, uploaded his to to the transient name server first. So he gets the credit for uh, correctly gets the credit for the classification. But what's interesting here, we have a a comparison here between the three teams, the only two three people take uh, amateurs taking spectra of supernovae. Uh, and this is my one with the LP200, R130, with my 11 inch telescope, 60 minutes exposure. This is the EXOS team with their LP600 uh, with a 50 micron slit resolution of about R300. They're using a 0.6 meter telescope, 24 inch. Uh, and their exposure was 180 minutes, three hours. And finally, uh, Claudia Balcons uh, was with his home-built spectrograph, R100, his 16-inch uh, telescope, and a four-hour exposure. So, so he, he really uh, was dedicated with that one to, to get that spectrum. But it's interesting to see that uh, all of us were able to classify this uh, this supernova without any difficulties. So uh, it's an interesting comparison, I think. Uh, finally, something with the Shiliak version of the LP200, which isn't a supernova. This is a magnitude 17 galaxy. It's an interesting galaxy. It's a dwarf galaxy and it's a starburst galaxy. So effectively, the whole of this dwarf galaxy is undergoing starburst. And the interesting thing about it is, uh, if you look at the papers on it, uh, what's happening, this is uh, this galaxy is accreting metal pore material from the surrounding intergalactic, uh, uh, the surrounding medium surrounding the galaxy, from the intergalactic medium. It's processing it through uh, massive, fast-burning stars and then ejecting uh, metal, metal rich material out of the poles. So this is a, a like a metal producing factory. It's taking in metal pore material from the intergalactic medium, processing processing it through uh, massive stars, a lot of which are producing supernova, um, and then ejecting it out of the poles back into the intergalactic medium. So this is enriching the intergalactic medium with. Uh, uh, with metals. Uh, and you can see it's a starburst galaxy from my spectrum here. Very clear, emission, strong emission lines, the expected lines you'd expect to see from a, uh, a, uh, a, a starburst galaxy. And here's the raw spectrum. And you can see the emission lines very clearly, magnitude 17. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my bit of presentation. Uh, this is a few uh, links. Uh, the top one is to my observatory uh, website. The second one is to the BAA gallery with my name on it. So uh, these are the obs interesting observations that I put up there. And you'll find a few more of uh, uh, examples taken with the LP200 as well as other spectrographs. And finally, all the spectra I take, hundreds of them, thousands now, uh, all go into the BAA spectroscopy database, so you can go and download them from there. Uh, so it's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to finding out uh, what people can do with these instruments, because I've had a lot of fun with it, and uh, I think uh, 
I think people can do even better than what I've managed. Uh, so uh, back to you, Francois, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robin. It was amazing. We we had great comments. Uh, maybe maybe we can maybe we can take a few questions. Um, if you look at the chat, uh, Robin, uh, there are a few questions. Yeah, I think it's great to to take them now uh, when we're in your in your presentation. The we have a question from uh, Alan. Uh, saying asking for two questions about the type of camera you are using for the uh, LP spectrographs. Uh, so, are you using a, a rolling shutter uh, camera or not? And do you reduce uh, signal, uh, the signal to noise ratio by averaging the signal along up and down the individual spectral line? So, this should reduce the noise. Okay, yes, yes. Um... Um. Uh, yeah. I've seen the questions, but okay. Okay. yeah, uh, the okay. yeah the cameras I'm using uh, the the main uh, imaging camera I use is uh, is an attic camera. Uh, I'm using the attic four two eight now, so it's a Sony chip uh, camera. Uh, yes, it's not rolling shutter. I don't think is it. I, I'm not an expert on uh, camera technology, but uh, yes. Um, also. Uh, the, the guide camera is a very, I'm using at the moment, a very old, another attic, very old camera, uh, IC2S or something. And that's also got a Sony chip. Uh, but I think uh, uh, probably people would use for guide cameras, more modern cameras than that now. Uh, but it probably needs to be cooled so you can see it. Uh, concerning the, the data reduction, I use uh, uh, ISIS for all my data reduction. Um, uh, it's a stand. I reduce uh, the spectra in the same way that I do for the LP six hundred. Uh, I do use uh, an ISIS feature, which is uh, optimizes the uh, the binning when it uh, when it extracts the spectrum, uh, and I think that's uh, that's quite important. That certainly helps. Uh, uh, reduce the noise, keeps the noise from the sky background out, for example, because it's uh, important only to bin those rows that have uh, useful signal in them and keep all, keep all the rows out that have the sky background noise in them. Um, uh, yeah, apart from that, the, the, the uh, data reduction is pretty much the same as a, a standard LP. Thank you. Uh, uh, we, we have well, the, 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 there is all the question behind about uh, CCD versus CMOS, and uh, no, I, I, yeah, uh, I don't know, I don't know anything about CMOS. I've never used it, so uh, I can't answer those questions. It's a yeah. big debate, I know. Uh, okay, and I, I, I know, and, and we keep aside, but the, this is uh, well. Of course, uh, today uh, so, uh, we, we are switching. We, we have already switched to the. Uh, uh, to the um, CMOS cameras for mo most of them. So we still, we can still uh, use some uh, CCD camera, but this is really the, the end of, uh, of the series very probably. Anyway, okay, so we, we have also another very interesting question uh, from Samuel in, in the chat again, uh, regarding the, the size of the telescope. So maybe we, we, we can discuss that point. Uh, so they have a 14 inch uh, telescope and uh, and they say so uh, should we use should we continue to use the uh, LP600 for faint targets like planetary nebulae uh, and, and use a 50 micron slit uh, or so do, do we have to increase the slit and keep the LP600 or and I know that there is an important question here and uh, I will talk again uh, about that uh, later on but uh, this question between the the size of the telescope and the the LP two hundred versus the LP six hundred, can can you? Yeah, what what I would say is there's another factor in that equation. It's the size of the telescope, and it's also the seeing, and the yeah. seeing is very important because if you're if you have three arc second seeing, and like me, and it matches perfectly my C eleven and a twenty three micron slit, that's almost a perfect match. So I run at f5. Um, if you if my seeing was one and a half, I could use twice the diameter of the telescope and still get 
all the uh, light through the slit. So it's it's very important to know what you're seeing is before you choose uh, what slit width to use. Um, the other thing is, uh, of course, as you increase your slit width, you're going to start losing even more resolution. Now, I would say you could you could go to a 35 micron slit and still get useful information. I think I could class probably classify all the supernova I did still with a 35 micron slit. But once you go to a 50 micron slit, your resolution's down at 60, something like that. Uh, and it, perhaps it starts getting difficult because what you want to do is you want to match your resolution to the width of the lines that you're looking at. So what you want, your ideal situation is that all the intensity of the light in the line sits on two pixels, two bins, and then you've concentrated it as much as you can do. Now, if you reduce your resolution uh, such that the resolution is lower than the width of your line, then you're smearing out that light that you in the line over more pixels and you're reducing your signal to noise ratio. Um, so it's, it's important to, to try and match the objects you're looking at with the resolution uh, of your instrument. Now with supernovae, uh, there the velocities are sort of five to 15,000 uh, kilometers a second. Now at a resolution of 130, which is what the ARPI uh, 200 has, uh, that resolution corresponds to two and a half thousand kilometers a second. So we're still narrower than the lines, the width of the lines in the supernova. So we can classify them, we can see them and classify them well. But once you start increasing, uh, decreasing your resolution, it, ma it makes it harder for the classification programs to get a good result. So uh, the answer is I don't know where the balance is. Uh, and I think we'll only find it when people start using the LP200. We're, we're, we're moving into new territory here. At the moment, there's only one LP200 in operation, and that's been in operation for 10 years now. Now, when we have two operating, we'll know a lot more about what it can do. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, the, the, what, what I've understood is clearly the, the LP200 is dedicated for small instruments. And, and uh, if you have a, a big telescopes, uh, probably you, 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 it's more than probably you will have better results with an LP600 and, and a wider slit and doing some billing. But we don't know exactly why is the frontier. And, and on top of that, as you said, it, it, always, it also depends on the, uh, on the seeing. So it's, it's, uh, we have to make uh, more tests and, and, and see how it works. So very interesting. We, we have also um, well, a, a good question from uh, Mikhail. I, I see that there is a lot of questions that are interesting. Uh, can you clarify uh, a bit more the difference between the LP200 and the Star Analyzer 200? <laughs> I love this question. Oh, right. <laughs> I can. I think I have a. Uh, I did produce a slide, but I can go through it. the uh, the advantage. The disadvantage of the star analyzer is that you can't keep the sky background out. That's the big disadvantage. So you see all your light pollution, and uh, the galaxy, and all the other stars, and the spectrum you produce is completely diluted against that background. So that limits how deep you can go. Also, because you're not normally guiding uh, star analyzer spectra, uh, you have to take shorter exposures and stack them, uh, which means you can't, you can't go as deep uh, as you can with a slit spectrograph. Now, you move to a slit spectrograph, uh, you, that removes nearly all the light pollution, certainly uh, probably 90 something percent of it because you have a slit therefore it keeps out most of the light pollution so you get rid of most of that problem um, and also because you have a nice guider you can put the star on the slit and you can keep it there and you can keep it there for 20 minutes at a time and you can expose for four hours if you like uh, and that allows you to go deeper now the LP2 and that's the LP600 now the LP200 takes it another step what we're doing there with the LP200, we're concentrating the spectrum onto 
a smaller area of the uh, sensor as possible. So we're maximizing the signal relative to the noise produced by the camera. Also, by moving from a 200 rate to a 200 rating, from, from a 600 rating to a 200 rating, uh, we have a more efficient grating. Because if you look at uh, 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 diffraction gratings, the coarser of the grating, the more efficient they are. So we actually get a gain efficiency. And that's the other step that the LP200 takes. So in terms of sensitivity, we have star analyzer, low resolution, not very sensitive. LP600, much better resolution, uh, also better at uh, on faint targets because you can keep the sky background out. And then the third step is the LP200, where we have higher efficiency, better signal to noise, and we can go even deeper. And well, um, maybe I'm not sure if everybody online uh, um, is familiar with the uh, the LP architecture and the uh, uh, star analyzer architecture. So for me, the big difference is the star analyzer is, is the grating only. So we put the grating in the converging beam of the telescope, where the LP is the grating plus um, lenses uh, before and after uh, the grating, and we have a slit before. So this is why we are talking about a slit a spectroscope for the LP or a slit less uh, spectroscope for the uh, for the star analyzer. And and by the way, the star analyzer is very very simple, and and uh, but uh, well, the difference is the slit. Okay. Uh, another um, another interesting question regarding uh, the guiding camera. Uh, because uh, there is something uh, I've perfectly understood is that uh, if you are doing a high resolution spectroscopy, the guide camera is not very critical. But when you are looking for very faint targets, uh, then the, 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 the guiding image and the, the capacity to see your target in, in your guiding camera, in your guiding image, uh, becomes more important. So maybe you, you, you may have, you can say something about that. And, I mean, on my side, I know that our recommendation today is to use uh, the, the cameras for the with the uh, IMX uh, 174 uh, from Sony, which which is the good balance between the pixel size, sensitivity, uh, chip size, and and so on. But uh, now, uh, if you if you really want to have a good um, sensitivity with long exposure time, maybe you have to have a good version. Personally, I don't know. At, where is the limit where, where you can have a gain in using a, a cool camera for the guiding? Yeah, I, I think I think with the uh, with the reason for having to go to a cool camera uh, with the LP200 at least is more to do with the fact that you have to be able to take an image which shows these very faint, faint targets. Now, when you're guiding, it doesn't matter because you can guide on a magnitude 12 or 10 star in the image but you have to be able to see what you're trying to take a spectrum of before you start so you have to have a camera that is good enough to take magnitude 18 or even 19 uh, images before you start okay the, and, and and again the world yes this is especially critical for the lower, lower resolution um olivier i have not been able to read all the questions olivier i don't know if you have read some well, you have a lot of thank you, Robin. <laughs> you will, you will. Uh... Thank you, every... thank you for all the thank yous. I hope you enjoyed it. Anyway, the... okay, so we, we can uh, switch. Uh, well, maybe to position the slit under. Yeah, 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 you cannot. Yes, you can. Well, did you try to use the uh, the uh, the plate solving to put uh, precisely the target in, in the slit? So okay. this is the question uh, I've read quickly from uh, Pascal Ledu. Yeah. Um, no, no, I, I don't use plate solving at all. I'm old school. I, I uh, what I do is I, I, I find my way around uh, the sky, and, and then when I get close, I use I just bring up a a, a DSS image. I use uh, carte de ciel, uh, and I bring up a DSS image, and I compare it with what I'm seeing in my in my guide camera, uh, and I find it from there. I have I have. Uh, I do have plate solving. I've tried it, but I, I I don't bother. So this is typically something that we that will be made by the next uh, uh, LP two hundred users. 
Yes. By yeah. the way, Pascal, if you are well, you are online, Pascal. Uh, I know that uh, you have an LP two hundred that you 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 will tell us uh, very quickly in coming uh, weeks or months uh, how it works. Anyway, the the and, and the, we had a question from uh, Woody Sims. Hello, Woody. And the the what is the f ratio uh, for Ooh. the telescope for the uh, LP two hundred? Uh, it is clearly an f uh, the 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 base is exactly the same as the LP six hundred. So it is an f five or even f four uh, spectroscope. So you can use very wide range of uh, of uh, telescopes. And of course, you have you better have to have an f five f four f four is even better. To have a smaller star and, and then to to put more light in the slit, so you, the, the faster your telescope, the the better. I think. Uh, well, I hope that I didn't miss uh, major questions. Now I can switch back to to my presentation. I don't have a lot of slides, and uh, I, I don't want to be boring. Um, uh, can you click, quickly tell me if you can see my screen? Yes, yeah. it says that's not good. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, just to come back on, on, on a few uh, elements. So uh, this is the general architecture of the spectroscope. I will, I will not spend a lot of time uh, on that, but you you have uh, um, a, a, a grism or prism or a grating. So a grism is a combination of prism and grating uh, in, in the middle of the instruments. And then in the LP architecture, unlike in many of uh, our spectroscopes, uh, you have uh, a lens before that we call the collimator lens. We, you have the slit, which makes the, the a very stable source, uh, light source, in, in, in which you have to put the, the, uh, the star. And, and then it, it, the, the collimator beams transform uh, the light coming from the source in a, a, um, a collimated beam, so parallel beam that goes through the disperser, so the dispersing element, and then behind that, so it will spread out the light depending on, on the wavelengths, and then we have another uh, lens behind uh, to, to concentrate again uh, the, the light uh, on the detector, but at different position depending on the angle of, of the uh, uh, ray output angle, and, and, and then you, you'll have the, uh, the, the spectrum that is made here by putting the the the, the result the the uh, image of the sources at different position different or dependent depending sorry on on the wavelengths well i'm not sure but um, I, I guess that most of you are very familiar with that and again if you are talking about uh, uh, the star analyzer you just remove this lens this lens you are, you remove the slit and you put the the grating directly uh, into the, uh, the the converging beam, and it will have the same result, but it will have a very um, a strong uh, optical limitation. So it will work, but uh, you'll not have the same quality. And as Robin said, you you'll not be able to use a slit, which is very useful to uh, in this case, especially to to remove the sky background. Now, if we if we look at um, uh, this uh, system, so this is the LP uh, the LP. Uh, 600 and you can see so the slit is in this plane here you have the, colli the, the collimator beam here and you have the grism and the grism in the LP600 is really what, what um, uh, Robin showed it, this is a grating put on a prism and we use that in such a way that we, we are using the, the grating to uh, spread out the light but it gives also some uh, by diffraction an angle to the beam and then we use the prism angle to, to put back uh, the, the spectrum uh, on the axis of the instrument. So th this is what makes that with the LP, we can have an instrument on the axis. For the LP200, we made a different choices. So, so we have made some tests. Uh, um, Robin showed you that he, his um, old prototype, or all uh, star analyzer, uh, not star analyzer, uh, the LP200, sorry, uh, the, the old one uh, had also an angle, a smaller angle than the, the, the LP600, but it had an angle. And then in this case, in our case, we decided after some tests to keep a, a non angle, so a, a flat prism, so it, it's not a prism anymore, it, it, it's just a grating, in fact, uh, on, the, on this surface here. And, and then we 
in this case, of course, we, we keep the system on the axis, but on the axis, we will have the zeros order and we'll see the, 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 the spectrum on the side of the image. So it can be a little bit disturbing uh, when, when we use to have uh, the LP600 image, but this is very easy to understand. By the way, this is the first run of the, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, LP200 gratings. And that we received uh, from uh, Patton Oskle, who is uh, still the, the manufacturer of this uh, this part. And then here is the kind of image that you can see. Uh, so it again, it can be a little bit uh, disturbing because you you see the zero order in the middle of the image, and then you see the first order here. And then the useful uh, spectrum is somewhere here. Maybe depending on what you are doing, maybe you can use uh, the uh, zero order to calibrate uh, your spectrum. And by the way, one advantage of having a pure grating and no more grism is that you you don't have you, you have a very good linearity in the dispersion, so you can measure uh, the, the 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 dispersion law very easily, and uh, it is very very linear. And well, uh, also you have to keep in mind that. Uh, when you are doing very low resolution spectroscopy, like uh, with the LP200, in fact, you, you are probably not looking for very accurate uh, wavelengths calibration uh, because you are, you are just looking for big features uh, in, in your spectrum. So this, the, 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 the wavelength calibration is not um, as important as if you were observing um, exoplanets uh, with a very high resolution uh, spectroscope. Okay, and something interesting in this image is that because you have the zero order in the middle of the image, you also have on the other side the order minus one. And so you have the order plus one and minus one. And by the way, you can see it and you can perfectly see it also uh, if you are looking at the sky uh, spectrum, the order number, uh, number plus one is much brighter than the order minus one. And this is the effect of the blaze of the grating, and, uh, which is a feature, the, the, the fact that the, the, the lines, um, the, 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 the graves uh, in, in the grating are not symmetrical. They have a shape that uh, gives some um, preference uh, to this order to concentrate as much um, uh, photons and as much light in this order and not in this one. Because of course, when you are looking at that, you are losing all the light that is on this side. And here you can really measure the efficiency of the grating. The more you have light on the right, in this case, uh, compared to the, the, the left, uh, then it gives you a, a good image of the efficiency of the grating. Uh, why this is, uh, we talk, so this is exactly what, what we discussed uh, uh, with the questions uh, about uh, the fact that the LP200 is limited to small telescopes. This is because if you have bigger telescopes, you have a, a bigger star image at the focal plane. Remember that the size of the image of the star uh, depends mainly on two parameters, the focal length of the telescope and the seeing of your sky. So uh, if you have a bigger telescope, you'll have a bigger star image uh, at the focal plane. And then if you want to catch all the, the photons from the star, you will have to increase the slit. But on the other hand, if you increase the slit, the, the slit size, then you will reduce the resolution. So the ability to see the details and as um, Robin said uh, th there is a limit. So if you if your resolution is uh, really too low, you'll not be able uh, to 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 find the scientific information you are looking for in the spectrum. Uh, for instance, uh, what, what um, uh, Robin um, showed about the, uh, the the supernova classification. Okay, so there is really a, a trade-off. The image we have so far, but uh, we are waiting now for all your tests and, and experience that we'll get together, is that um, uh, you, you can use a, a 23 microns slit or 35 microns slit, depending on the size of the telescope, mainly, and of course of your seeing. But it, I think that if you have to go to a bigger slit, like 50 micrometers, in this case, in, in this case you better have to use the LP600. Uh, so you have a, a wide slit, and in this case, you have to do some binning 
in your image to, to concentrate the, the energy in, in, in the pixels and, and, and not to have um, uh, oversampling. Uh, and, and, but really, the LP200 is, uh, for this reason, dedicated to small instruments. And by the way, there is very probably something very interesting to do with a very small instrument uh, with the LP200 uh, to go for faint, faint targets, even with a small... Uh, uh, 80 uh, millimeter telescopes or things like that. This is another another door. Now, uh, when I look at the um, uh, more uh, commercial side, uh, if you're interested, um, I have here uh, the, the different elements. So we have made three uh, references for you. The first one, maybe, I don't know if you can see my, my uh, well, I will, I will stop sharing my screen to show you what I want to show you. So this is the LP200. Uh, okay, this is exactly externally, it is exactly the same as the LP600. Uh, you have understood that only the, the, the grating, uh, the, the grism is re replaced by the grating. And this is the, the main part. So uh, this is uh, uh, the, the, the standard product, I would say. And uh, you, you have, of course, to add uh, the, uh, the guiding module uh, if you want to to look to use it uh, on a telescope, and and we recommend that you also add the calibration module to make your, your life simple uh, to to get the the calibration and the flats. By the way, uh, regarding the calibration, you can really do the job uh, with the LP two hundred uh, by using a, a hot star, uh, using the Balmer lines uh, to do the calibration, and and that's it. So. I think that for this reason, the calibration module is probably less uh, necessary for the LP200. Now we have uh, also, we because this is the same as uh, the LP200, uh, uh, 600, sorry, a lot of you uh, already have uh, LP600. So we have planned uh, to sell only what we call the core module. Okay, so you can see it. So it's very small. And, and this is, um, so this is the, the, the LP200. We have changed the, the, the marking and we have a red point to, to mention, to show that this is an LP200 and not 600. So, uh, and, but uh, the, the mechanical parts are the same, but the cutting inside is uh, the uh, LP200. So the idea is to have something very cheap. If you just want to test and to switch uh, from uh, one, one version to the other, and you don't want to buy the whole system uh, a second time, uh, then you can do that. And then we have a third um, a proposal, third, third reference, which is something uh, uh, yeah, somewhere in the middle, uh, which is what we call the switch module. And in fact, this is uh, the, 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 the the, the same uh, the, the core in fact uh, of the LP, but we have added uh, the the parts that comes from the guiding module, and this way uh, you can switch very quickly just by removing the the, the six screws there. You can switch from one uh, instrument to the other uh, on the telescope even during the night. So if you have already an LP six hundred and you if you want to switch to an LP200 uh, quickly, even during the night, you can do it. Of course, it is better if you also have a second camera with your uh, this module, but even without this module, it, it allows you to quickly change and without um, uh, breaking uh, all the tuning of the instruments. So you, you don't have to uh, uh, tune again uh, all the instruments. And something important for, with this module that we call the switch module, and, and this one, which we call the core module, the small one, uh, we have decided to sell it without the slit because depending on what you are doing, you will need either a 23 microns or the 35 microns. Then we decided not to provide the, the slit and then you'll have to buy, if you want, uh, separately uh, the slit, okay? I come back to my presentation. Okay, so uh, I've put the, 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 the prices here and the, uh, the reference of the product. So this is the full module, this is the, the, the switch module, and this is the core module that, that I just showed you. And um, well, probably you have uh, the, the question, when will it be available? It is already available uh, since uh, today afternoon. And and uh, so it, all the you can place order uh, from now 
uh, on our on the, the Shellac website uh, for the three modules, and uh, we have some stocks. Well, for for sure, if all of you uh, do place an order for an LP two hundred today, maybe we'll be short uh, to to serve everybody. But uh, I know it will not be the case. Uh, but anyway, if you're interested, please do it. But this is now available and all is online uh, since today. And we have, so you know what is the, the, the Sheliak website. So it's uh, www.sheliak.com. And you can uh, just uh, look for LP200 and you'll find the information. And we have also put a, a, a paper, an article uh, that explains in few words what is this instrument. Of course, now you 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 know all about this product, but uh, this is to tell you that we, you have all the information uh, that you need. And that's it. I'll finish this presentation. And if you have questions, it will be a pleasure to answer. Um, François, uh, 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 we can do the survey now. Um, and uh, for all, all the attendees, we have a survey. Uh, so if you want to answer this survey, it's just uh, five, I think, five questions about uh, the LP200. So I launch now the, the survey and you can answer. Or to answer the survey, you have uh, a button on the bottom of your screen and you can uh, now uh, start to answer this uh, survey. And, and by the way, thank you, Olivier. Uh, um, uh, I would have forgotten to, to talk about this survey, which is important. And especially we have a few questions. We are interested to know uh, uh, what you, you plan to do, especially to organize uh, our production, uh, our instrument, instrument production. Especially, personally, I'm, I'm curious to know which version of the LP200 you would be interested in even if uh, this is not for today or next week, but uh, tell us what is your your impression. And, and by the way, also we'll have uh, the result in real time about uh, uh, how faint uh, targets you have been able to observe so far. That that is uh, very interesting. I don't know if everybody sees the the result of the. Survey in real time. No, 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 not. Uh, uh, I, I will uh, put the uh, the result after all attendees have uh, answered the question. Uh, I have the votes for now, so I can see uh, all the votes. But uh, all participants can't uh, now uh, see the votes. I, I will uh, show you after. So now we can answer uh, more questions if you have. Uh, don't hesitate to ask a question, even in live, huh? uh, or, or by the chat, uh, if you want. <laughs> uh, we have a question about uh, Michael. Uh, is an LP200 uh, is a good choice for a spectra of comets? Yeah, I, I can answer that one. Uh, yeah, I've, I've used the LP200 for comets, uh, which are faint. Uh, and you can see some on my uh, uh, VAA page. Uh, but what I've learned with comets is uh, is the problem is getting a good fraction of the light through the slit. So uh, small, fast telescopes tend to work better than large, slow ones. So, uh, but uh, have a look on my uh, VAA page, and you'll see some comet spectra taken with all my different spectrographs, which will give you an idea uh, what the LP two hundred can do compared with the others. And we have another question from Jeff. Uh, what size, uh, size on the F ratio telescope you recommend for the new LP200 spectroscope? As I, as I said before, the, the recommendation is F, F5, F4, or why even, even F6. But the, the faster you have, so the, the lower uh, F ratio you have, uh, the, 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 the smaller uh, the image uh, at the focal plane will be. So uh, ideally, F, uh, F5, F4. And uh, another question from Steve. How long uh, will it take to switch uh, between the LP600 to the 200 if you're using just the core module? Well, uh, <laughs> it depends how agile you are. <laughs> No, the, uh, this is the, this is quite easy because um, uh, I don't know. Yes, I can I can stop sharing my screen. And if I take this module, 
just to show you, and if I remove uh, uh, this part, this is really to, to, to explain you how difficult it is. You have three, can you see them? Yes, I think you have three screws there and there uh, at 120 degrees. You just have to remove these screws, then you can remove the core module, put the other one, and and and, uh, and tighten back uh, the, 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 these three screws. And you have to make sure that your orientation of your, your spectrum is correct. And, and that's it. So it really takes well, a few minutes. Of course, the first time it will be probably more complex, but you, it takes a few minutes to, 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 to replace it. Well, but, it, but I think it, it, can, it can be useful really to, to have a quick uh, replacement to use that because it will be faster. And, Again, I think it is really uh, feasible to do it during the night. Now, on my side, personally, I think that changing the instrument during the night is a mistake. And, and I think it is never a good idea. But, but I know that some, some people want to do it and, 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 and they have the right to do it. I can, I can make some practical comments there. Mm -hmm. but, um, the, uh, the, I think the problem with just using the core module and changing it over quickly, uh, don't you have to refocus? Refocus, which is which is uh, takes time with the LP. Yeah. Now I I I started just by changing the grism, and that's complicated, of course. Uh, but uh, I soon uh, bought the extra components so that I could do the switch version. And the big advantage of the switch version is everything stays in focus. Everything's there and you put it in. And in fact, there's another, another good tip that some people might know. Um, I use a very narrow dovetail uh, coupling between the camera and the LP. And in fact, I use it on the Lyras as well. And the advantage with that is you can put the camera on, you can change the camera over from one to the other. And rotate it with it without disturbing the focus on on the alpi uh, and i found that very useful barda make a very thin one it's only about five millimeters and with my camera i can still get focus easy and it's a, uh, that's uh, been a really useful uh, extra uh, to both my spectrographs yeah thanks for that robin i think what i was uh the reason that i asked uh like francois was saying i don't see myself wanting to change in the middle of the night so dur a, a night where i might want to use the 200 i wouldn't be using the 600 so moving over checking rotation checking focus during the day knowing that i intend to do it that night then uh i might be better off but yeah if i could just switch over keep the camera focused keep the rotation and everything else set that would be very handy so does that uh the the other module give me the the ability to do that so i, I can use the same camera i i would say start with the start with the core element and mm -hmm. see how you go and there's I would say there's no problem buying the extra bits if you decide later to build it up. Is that right, Francois? Well, yes. Well, you, you know that we we can sell any part uh, of any instrument. So uh, yes, it is it is true. Now this this module is uh, well. If you have the core module, uh, this this module includes the core module also. So. Uh, but anyway, I, I agree with you. And by the way, there is something I want to add is that this module, in fact, this is another suggestion from uh, from Robin <laughs> a few weeks ago, and we, we decided to add it for this particular reason. And we have uh, another question from Samuel. Uh, can we still use Demetra for processing LP2 and wet spectra? Oh, this is a very important question that I didn't cover. Uh, yes, uh, so we don't have a specific version for the LP200 uh, Demetra, and then I recommend, well, I recommend that you use the Demetra, uh, the LP600 uh, version of Demetra, and all will be absolutely similar. The only point is that regarding the calibration, you'll, you'll probably have to use not the automatic calibration, but you'll, you'll have to take uh, um, uh, um, to, to take the spectrum of a, a bright, uh, not bright, a hot star 
uh, A or B, where you clearly see the Balmer lines and use this observation to uh, establish, to calculate uh, the dispersion law and then apply it uh, to all the other observations. So this is the only difference uh, between the LP600 and the LP200, uh, I think. But the, 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 uh, for, all, for, for the rest of the software, this is exactly the same. So you can use uh, Demetra. And, and by the way, well, this is important for us that uh, we propose the metro, but you, you can also use any other uh, software. And I, I don't want to uh, enclose anybody uh, in, in this software. And we have another question from Michel. Uh, if I buy the LP200 and want to switch to the LP600 later, if the core module of the 600 will be available? Well, today it is not available. Well, it is not available on the website. Again, again if you want it, we, we can make it for you. And, and uh, we'll see over the time if, if there is a demand for that. And it, it can make sense, in fact, to do the, the, the same in, in the other direction. Start with the LP200 and extend it to the LP600. Then if there is a lot of demand, then we will make it available. But at the moment, we start with this situation. Again, we do consider that the, the LP600 is the reference, and then we can extend it uh, and, and, uh, to the LP200. But we'll see, uh, it, it will depend on you now. And the question from James, will the LP600 calibration module still work with the LP200 and AISIS? So with, with the LP200, uh, as I said, yes, exactly in the same conditions. The only point, again, is that uh, probably, you, you know that the calibration module, we, we uh, I do consider that, well, I can make it this way. Uh, I, I do consider that when you are working with the LP600, uh, the, uh, the guiding module is mandatory if you put the LP on a telescope, if you want to do some work on a bench, Maybe you, well, you, you don't need the guiding module. The guiding module is really to be sure that you are putting the right star in the, in the slit of the spectroscope. And so it is mandatory if you put it on a telescope. And, and the calibration module, is, it is never mandatory, but it is very helpful because it, because it helps you to give all the reference images that makes the, the, the data reduction fast and easy. Okay, so this is the, the way with the uh, with the LP600. Now it works also with the LP200. The, the only difference is again that the dispersion law is so simple and, and so linear so that you can you can really uh, it is possible to avoid uh, using uh, the, the calibration module for the calibration. Now I think it is still very useful for the flat, and of course the, the flat are understand to calculate the response curve of the instrument. Maybe, maybe you can you can add some comment, uh, Robin. Yeah, I I, uh, I use the calibration module with the LP two hundred uh, with ISIS. Uh, I haven't used the lamp to calibrate the spectrum, the uh, wavelength. Uh, I'm using the same technique with Balmer lines in the uh, in the reference star. Um, Concerning the flat, yes, I use the calibration module for the flat. Uh, the only problem with ISIS is um, because there's a lot, if you look at the flat of the, the, the LP200 produces, then most of it is black, only the part where the uh, spectrum is. Uh, and that uh, we found that that confused ISIS. Uh, and the answer was to uh, crop just the region with the spectrum in it. So before you process with ISIS, you crop all your images so that they just contain uh, the spectrum. And then ISIS runs fine and produces the right flat and corrects it. So uh, that's what I found with it. And I do, I do use the calibration module for that. OK, thank you. Aziz has a selection. Well, ISIS, ISIS has a selection uh, for the LP600 calibration lines uh, with the calibration module. Will there be a new version that supports the LP200? So I, I doubt that there will be a new uh, version from, uh, uh, for, uh, from ISIS. 
But anyway, you can, again, you can, in ISIS, you can perfectly uh, calculate the dispersion law and then apply it uh, to, uh, to your spectra. So you can really manage, uh, you can fully manage the, uh, the data reduction of the LP200 with ISIS. Yes, I, I confirm that I use uh, uh, ISIS uh, for, with the LP200 uh, for calibration wavelength using the Balmer line with ISIS. Uh, the, the last version uh, available on the Christian Will website, so it works. But you can you also use the SpecinT software, which is very great to uh, to do calibration with uh, LP200. It works uh, also. Uh, that's something I can comment on as well. Uh, the question was whether we could use the lines in the uh that the produced in the calibration lamp with isis now i think that with the the uh the Sheliac, uh, version of the lp200 we probably should be able to find two or three lines in the calibration module lamp uh, which are good enough uh, the problem is because the resolution is so low the lamp lines uh there's a lot of blended lines, and it's difficult to pick ones out, ones out which are uh, separate and resolved enough for ISIS to pick out automatically. Uh, so uh, there's a question whether ISIS can do that automatically yet or not. But the, the Balmer line uh, system works fine. Okay, uh, no more question. Uh, I can show you the result of the survey if you want. Yes. Alors, share the result. So, you will see the result. Uh, maybe François will be comment uh, the result. Well, the, the, the first question was, uh, do you already have an LP600? Uh, well, half of, of people uh, do have a, an LP600 and the other half doesn't. So perfect. Uh, there, there is almost no winner. Uh, what kind of target did you observe? So most of you, so fifty, more than fifty percent, did observe uh, below uh, the magnitude twelve, so bright targets. And uh, we have five people at magnitude uh, thirteen, six people at fourteen, four people at uh, fifteen, and and only four be, uh, above uh, magnitude uh, sixteen. I don't know if you did answer the uh, the survey, uh, Robin. <laughs> I'm sure you. Yeah. No, no, I'm not. No, no. <laughs> Your survey didn't yeah. go far enough. I mean, eighteen, nineteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, the, the, and by the way, the, this this show this shows the, the the room that we have in front of us. So all the, the this is really uh, this really uh, open new observations, and I love that. And now, uh, so this was the question I was interested in for organizing our production. Uh, so most of you would be interested by the full LP two hundred. But the two other versions uh, could be also interested with the 26 and 35, 1%. Perfect. And now, what are the targets you are willing to observe? And uh, most of you are, uh, want plans to observe supernovae. Again, Robin, I, I'm, I'm sure this is because of you. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that this is very good, of course. And and uh, the next is the Nova, uh, and then the planetary nebulae, and then the B star, the faint B star, and uh, the symbiotics and others. There is ten person uh, looking for other targets, which is very interesting because it means that there is again a, a wonderful field of uh, to play uh, in in the next uh, weeks, months, and years. Okay. Maybe we can stop here. We were longer than we did expect, but uh, it was, an, I think, an interesting meeting. Well, thank you for all your questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Robin, uh, for your presentation and all what you are doing uh, for the, the astronomy and the, and the spectroscopy. And it was a great pleasure to see all your faces. And uh, again, we will see you soon, I hope, in, in next workshop. And anyway, we continue to be in contact by email, by the forums, by the distribution list, and so on. Okay? Say bye-bye to everybody.